see. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Christina. I'm a regional coordinator here in New York for She Jumps. I'm here with Bethany and Katie. We are here for part two of the Making History webinars. If you aren't familiar with She Jumps, we're a local community, or actually we're national, I shouldn't say that, but I'm local here in Saratoga area. And our mission is to increase the participation of women and girls in outdoor activities. I've been with She Jumps since I think 2018. And I found them when I came across an event for downhill mountain biking. I really wanted to try it and I didn't have anyone to go with. So I was like, I'm just, I'm going to go. And I met all these really cool women and I became an ambassador and I'm so glad I did. Um, the community is awesome. So I'm really excited. There's so many of you on here today and I hope that you continue to follow She Jumps, stay up to date with the events that we have and just stay connected. Um, before we get started, I just want to have a uh, talk about a few housekeeping items. Number one, the event is going to be recorded. So if you want to go back and rewatch some of it, or if you know there's others that you'd like to share this with, um, you will get the link to the YouTube recording once it's done. Um, we are also going to do a Q&A session at the end. So be sure to put your questions in the Q&A chat as you go if you want. And then at the end, we can go, we can go through them all for a few minutes. Um, if you have a question for one of the presenters specifically, um, just make sure to put a note uh, with their name in the chat. And without further ado, welcome Bethany and Katie. And we're here and happy and excited to hear you talk about packing and how you prepared for this trip. So I'm going to let you take it on over. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you, Christina. Really appreciate it. And we're going to get right into it because we are on the clock. So hello, <laughs> everyone. My name is Bethany Gerritsen. And just got to get the slide to work here. Here we go. Katie and I are going to talk <laughs> about our historic unsupported through hike of the 46 high peaks in the Adirondacks. And we're going to go into a brief summary of what that is, what that means. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty details of what we brought, what gear we chose to bring and leave behind and what food uh, fueled us during that. So this is part two we were on two weeks ago. So um, if you weren't able to join us then that is also recorded for you to see online. So we'll go right into introductions. My name is Bethany Gerritsen. I go by B. Uh, Katie very lovingly calls that, um, calls me that on trail. So it's kind of <laughs> hot and I call her KT and uh, also known as Pink Lightning. That is my trail name. And I am a professor at Paul Smith College and Clarkson University. And it's probably pretty easy to see why I'm referred to as pink lightning. It is one of my favorite colors. And I am also a writer and a mountaineer, and I am an advocate for environmental and social justice issues. I teach a lot of that at Paul Smith College. I teach environmental history, social justice, diversity, and inclusion by design. Uh, one of my life goals is to make the outdoors a more inclusive space for all of us to enjoy. I also teach wilderness therapy and that's one of um, the deer classes um, that I really enjoy teaching because I do really believe in the therapeutic benefits of nature and it's really important for us all to be able to access that. So from a very wee young age, I have been a lover of hats as you can see in that quite cute photo. And um, I continue to be as I've gotten older too. So, and then that photo with the Paul Smith students that was taken out in Ure, Colorado. And then there is one on Mount Baker. So a little bit of West Coast and Central there. So going to Katie. All right. Hi guys, I'm Katie Rhodes, um, also known as Lady Logic. Um, so we've got lightning over there. Um, I, my favorite color is blue, so I tend to, to theme that way. Um, but as far as the logic goes, I'm, I'm definitely a planner. Um, I do a lot of the bushwhacking, um, you know, studying the map, using the compass. Um, 
just logistically like getting details down, things like that. So that's, it's a very descriptive name for me, my trail name there. Um, my kind of what I call big girl job is as an industrial hygienist for SUNY Polytechnic Institute in Albany. Um, so for those of you that don't know what that is, it's not a dental hygienist. I get that question a lot. Uh, I'm responsible for um, assessing and mitigating occupational hazards. So things like chemical exposure, high noise exposure, biological hazards, um, radiation, things of that nature. So I, it's my job to make sure people go home safe at the end of the workday. Um, I'm also the public education director and leave no trace trainer for Adirondack Mountain Rescue. So that is a technical search and rescue team based out of Clifton Park, New York, um, just north of Albany. Uh, I'm a New York state licensed hiking guide, which is something I love to do bringing beginners or folks that are just looking for a little bit of guidance out into the backcountry, showing them my favorite trails, um, teaching them some hard skills while we're out there uh, and getting paid to do it. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm a mental health awareness advocate. So as part of our unsupported through hike, one of the things that we did was raise money for the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. Um, and that just kind of kickstarted my desire to you know, have advocacy for, for mental health specifically um, part of my persona and who I am and what I do and what B and I do. Um, we're really passionate about that because it affects so many things in our culture. Um, I did lose my brother to suicide in 2011. So it's something that really touches home for me and is personal. And we were really proud that the through hike was able to raise over $4,000 for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention by the time we were finished. Uh, and last but not least, I am a homesteader and a fur baby mama. So I have lots of furry kiddos here at the house. Um, my husband and I live just outside of Saratoga Springs, New York, and we have a little homestead um, you know, a barn, chickens, um, our guard dog there, Avery, she's not very scary. Um, and Luke, I'm not entirely sure what sort of, you know, what purpose he serves on the farm yet, but he's pretty snuggly. So we let him stay. Um, and we're just hoping to, you know, grow a lot of our own food and be self-sufficient. Awesome. All right. So what did we do? What are we talking about? We became the first known women uh, to complete the unsupported through hike of the 46 high peaks. So we're in the Adirondacks. We are in New York state. We are in Northern New York state and we have 46 mountains that are above 4,000 feet and they are rough and wild. And you actually get a lot of vertical gain when you go out and you climb the high peaks. And so what Katie and I did in September we did it unsupported, hiking all 46, starting at point A, going to point B with no sort of support in the meantime. It was 183 miles with 65,000 feet of elevation gain. And we were averaging a good old mountain marathon a day. And it took us seven days, four hours and 50 minutes. And we have the fastest female time because we have the first on record and we have the third fastest overall time. Katie, you wanna take the intro to our speech today? Yeah, sure. Um, so we do wanna get down into the nitty gritties of the logistics because we get a lot of questions about the details of what did you bring? Why did you bring it? What did you do for food? That sort of thing. Um, so we'll start with gear. Um, and first and foremost, of course, you know, we had to bring the 10 essentials. Um, so you probably heard of that list there. We've got it all laid out. And we'll go one by one through each of these components of that essential gear list and explain how we filled it and how we didn't fill it. Um, this was a pretty primitive way to go about this trip. Um, because you're unsupported, you're carrying absolutely everything on your back. So, you know, any food we ate, any gear we used, everything except for water, which was uh, ionized or sanitized from natural sources only. That was the only thing that was consum consumable that we replenished over time. Um, so everything else was on our back. And obviously you need to consider, you know, you can't be carrying a hundred pounds up and down these mountains and, and last out there um, for seven days. It's, it's just too much wear and tear on the body. So there's this fine balance between how much weight are you bringing while still making sure that you have all the essentials that you need to go through this entire week um, without looking for assistance. So um, 
your 10 essentials, of course, it's going to be your shelter, navigation tools, map and compass, things like that. Insulation. So we'll go through the layers that we wore, um, how we kept warm, how we kept cool. Illumination, super important. We were hiking at night quite a bit, which was necessary in order for us to get the mileage uh, in the number of mountains done that we did each day. Hydration, um, you know, how we sanitized our water. Nutrition, I'll go into a little bit more after this. I'll get into the specifics of the food uh, that we brought and how we managed our food systems because managing your food is just as important as what you actually brought and consumed. First aid, of course, is super important. You wanna make sure you're prepared if there's some sort of a medical situation. Um, repair kit, so, you know, we just went with the basics, things like spare shoelaces, a little bit of gear tape, um, some zip ties, just what are the basics that we can make do if we have a gear failure in the field and then fire. Um, so I will show you my stove and what we use to cook our dinners at the end of the day. Um, so kind of starting with insulation, uh, B and I are actually wearing the clothes that we had on during our through hike. So um, B, if you wanna go first, you're kind of set up for it. Maybe you can break down your layers that you're wearing and then I'll go through mine. Yeah, so hopefully now you can see me on a bigger screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Katie and I thought it would be cool to wear the clothes that we wore. So I have on a shell top. And again, this is a Spartan effort. You're either going to get it or you're not. And we had to just try to go as light and as fast as we could. So I took a rain jacket. I did not take rain pants. So this was my outfit. And I took one spare pair of socks and one spare pair of underwear. The rest I just wore every day. And I had a sleeping poly set and a fleece. But that was all I took for clothing. So under the, the top, the shell, um, I have on a light poly top. This was perfect for September weather. And if I got too hot, I just took it off and I hiked in my bra. And then I have some very quick drying prana pants that I like. And then La Sportiva, I don't know if you can really see. Um, oh yeah. They are, <laughs> yeah, they're my favorite, favorite. And um, then for the hair, keeping it up out of my face, have a buff that I even cut into four different strips so that it's a thinner piece of buff. I also cut tags out of clothes. You kind of get in this mindset of I'm going to take off every little ounce or every little half and half of an ounce that I can. And I've had some really great mentors with this who just always upgrade to the lightest, um, most durable stuff. So Katie and I were able to start with packs with all our food weight, all our water weight. Our packs weighed around 30 pounds. Now for one week of backpacking, that's a pretty light backpack. So we very much intentionally did that so that we had the best shot of getting this record because it's going to take a physical toll on your body and you're not going to use it you don't take it. And again, we were calculating what we could get away with not taking and being able to finish it. And you're, it's a risk, you know, it's a calculation. And that's what Katie and I really like about FKTs or fastest known times, especially of this scale and effort is you have to have it come together. So um, this is what my pack looks like. And uh, we're on insulation, so I'm going to go one more step into what our sleeping looks like. So half of a ground pad. I just had some dirt fly up into my face <laughs> from opening that again. Old fashioned Adirondack dirt. <laughs> yeah. So we cut ground pads in half to save all that weight of a ground pad, which again, it's, um, it's a principle, it's a practice. You do it with everything, you're going to save a few pounds in the end of it. Okay, pulling out my sleeping bag. Here comes the bear canister. Lightweight bear canister. 
in the high peaks, you have to have bear canisters during the summer and fall because of our black bear activity. So to sleep at night, I would put, would empty my pack out, put my pack on the ground with that half sleeping pad. And then let's see if we can show this. That's what my bed looks like. Looks cozy. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's my little doggy. He loves tents. And um, you can see our very lightweight tent that Katie and I got into together. And that's a 13 pound dog. So you can get a little bit of scale there as to how small that tent is and cozy, I might add. Katie, you wanna a, jump in? That's a big Agnes um, ultralight two person. Yes. Is that tent. Yeah, that's one of the lightest two person tents on the market. So we got really lucky that we had a, a tent like that available to us for the through hike. Yes. So I'll go through mine real quick and then I'll, I'll oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so I can go through my layers real quick and then I'll let you um, take over the rest of the gear review. Yeah. Awesome. So I've got all my layers on that I brought with me on the trip. So just a basic hard shell, just like the, I went with a hard shell on the exterior for weather protection, precipitation, wind, um, and just generally keeping heat in. Um, I decided to bring along a um, fleece, a hybrid fleece layer. So um, this is my favorite hybrid fleece. This is part of just my general um, layering system in the winter. I wear this as well. This is always my first mid layer. So it's a North Face Summit series um, with venting technology. So it's fancy. <laughs> um, and I just wear the, the heck out of this thing. Um, it's got insulation in the base and then it's got this waffle texture in the arms. So it does, it releases some heat so you don't overheat. Um, and then my base layer was just a short sleeve. Um, I think it's an Eastern Mountain sports top that I got like a decade ago. <laughs> so just classic, you know, synthetic short sleeve um, did right by me. Uh, just like B, I brought a buff with me. These were great because we didn't need to bring a hat as well. Um, we could pull them up, put them over our ears, have them around our neck, um, you know, just for general uh, retention of warmth there if we needed them. Uh, so they were kind of multi-purpose wipe away the sweat, that kind of thing. Uh, we both had our gooders on. So uh, just our classic mine blue, hers pink. That was kind of our classic style on the through hike. These were great for sun protection, wind protection, because your eyes will start to dry out when you just are in exposure day after day like that. Um, and then, you know, when you're exhausted at the end of the day, you just put your glasses down and, you know, go into your own little space. <laughs> um, yeah. For my pants, I don't know if you can see these very well. These are just outdoor research. I just went with basic hiking pants. I really like these ones because they cinch at the ankle. So it kind of keeps them up out of the dirt and the muck and that kind of thing. And I can also pull them up and make them capris on the warmer days. So again, multi-purpose, you're thinking about how many purposes can this one piece of gear serve so that you're not you know, using up extra weight for multiple pieces of gear. Um, and then of course my socks, I just use Swiftwick socks. These are the actual socks I used in the through hike. You can tell because they're still like stained brown permanently. Um, just like ankle swift wick running socks. I like them because they're kind of built for a lot of friction and movement and they tend to um, prevent blisters for me. Um, fun fact, we only had one blister between us the entire seven days. So I think that's a pretty good statistic. Um, and then last but not least, my shoes. Um, again, these are the actual shoes that I wore in the through hike. Uh, still caked with Adirondack mud. I can't bring myself to get rid of them. Um, I wear the Ultra Lone Peaks. Uh, I am kind of a zero drop fanatic. Um, once you go zero drop, you can't go back really, unfortunately. Um, doesn't feel right anymore. And then the wide toe box served me well. Again, no blisters um, anywhere on my foot throughout the entire trip. So these shoes did right by me. Um, at night, I just had a long sleeve three quarter zip, again, just a synthetic top. Uh, and then I'm a huge fan, whether it's um, cooler nights in the fall or um, base layers under my soft shells in the winter of these bamboo leggings. Uh, they are, they're called booty brand. So B-O-O-D-Y. Um, they're just, they're very similar in terms of wicking and 
wicking away moisture and um, keeping odor down. They're very comparable to wool, but they're not nearly as expensive. They're like quarter of the price of a wool piece of gear. So um, I'm thrifty, so that, that speaks to me. <laughs> All right, D. Great, great. So yes, I like that Katie hit on our, our fashion out there because you know what? After not bathing for seven days, you gotta just put the shades down and go. Yep. <laughs> and, and embrace it. So I think we each packed seven wipes each. So that was a treat at the end of the day to wipe our feet and armpits. And I am going to share a document that we had. So is that document coming up, Katie? Yes. Yep. Excellent. So Katie is is a planner and I thought I was a planner until I met Katie and that's why she is lady logic and she just has the she has everything and if something breaks she is the one that's going to fix it if there's something that's forgotten I'm the one who forgot it <laughs> and I was the one that got the blister too and she was the one that had the tape that helped so we are we complement each other really well we do. and Definitely. Um, yeah, because lots of times I think like, big picture, we can do this. And then Katie's like, how will we do this? And yeah, B talks me into it. And then <laughs> yep. I figure out how. <laughs> exactly. So this is what we had going between us. And Katie and I, we met two months before we did the through hike together. We did not know each other long. We were really getting to know each other on trail. We had gone out and done a few scouting missions together but really like there were still things when I'm on trail with Katie during the through hike where I'm observing her and I'm like I don't know what she's feeling right now you know we didn't know each other on that personal level yet at the beginning by the end we certainly did um however it was important for us to communicate from the very beginning and we shared this word doc in google drive and it was beautiful because I got to edit, she got to edit, and we were constantly texting each other or messaging each other of like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? We were talking to people who had held the record at one point or another, and you can see um, the current record holders there. And we had their time written out because this is the time we were going for, and then we were actually breaking it out hour by hour of how and when we were going to finish. So this was our original daily breakdown. We had to deviate from it a bit on day five because of the storm that hit us. Um, however, this is the formula we had to beat the current record. And we were on point until day five with the storm. Uh, day four, sorry, it was yep. day four storm. I was like, that's not right. <laughs> One day off there. <laughs> okay. so. You can see meticulous. Katie made that graph. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. And when you see the mileage and the elevation broken out, it helps you see what you have to put in each day. Um, day three was our big, big day. Um, I mean, they're all big days. Not going to lie. <laughs> not going to lie. It's not easy. Uh, what was really important for us was to know exactly which gear we were bringing um, down to the toothbrush and the amount of toothpaste. And I brought in a teeny tiny little travel toothbrush, like kind of those one-time use toothbrushes. And then I just brought in like a little bit of extra toothpaste. So again, just going Spartan in pretty much all aspects walking into this. Uh, we did carry a bear canister each, um, upholding that law, that LNT in the backcountry. Also, too, black bears are super active, and it would have been stupid not to because we probably would have had an issue with that. Stove, pot, and fuel, uh, tent. So we broke it out into group gear, emergency gear, water system, and then personal gears. Uh, this is a technique I use with my students in trip planning and Adirondack study courses. So it's really valuable, I feel, in just about any organizing of a trip. 
you can use it for. You don't have to go after what Katie and I did, but this really works for a weekend trip to the Adirondacks, um, especially when you're hiking with someone that, you know, maybe you don't hike with all the time. So for Katie and I, we had emergency gear. We also had a risk management plan because that was really important to us as backcountry educators that we were going to go for something that was going to be challenging, that was going to be hard, that was going to be pushing our limits mentally and physically. And we did not want to be a strain on the DEC um, or rangers in our area because we are, you know, we never wanted to push ourselves to that level. So we did have extraction points. We shared our plan with two people. They were our outside um, coordinators, but they were really just like that person we call to let them know where to pick us up. Uh, we also shared our map with a lot of people to be like, we should be here by this time. And in the high peaks, we knew where we had cell phone service. So we would communicate on summits where there was service. So that was our system. And um, we kept our phones off and just fully charged until we had to send out a text or we were doing the bushwhack. Um, we took masks because we're living in a pandemic and Katie and I debated if we should even go for this during COVID, if it was safe. And in the end, we decided to push our start back, <laughs> push back our start date after Labor Day weekend, after some of the crowds um, dissipated. And we also felt that our levels of COVID in the area were low enough for us to give it a safe attempt. So we did, we went for it, we had our mask um, and we had them ready to put on. Uh, so pain meds we also had and very refined med kits with uh, ankle tape, uh, mole, well not mole skin, but the stuff for blisters. Katie, what Luco is that? Luco what is it? Luco type, Luco tape. Yeah. Yeah. So Katie is also the one that knows the name to everything. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, it's just in the back of your brain somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's new. I will say a lot of these things like Luco tape, I did not know about until I met Katie. She introduced me to a lot and I'm very thankful for that. So water system was simple. We took water bottles and iodine. I'm gonna grab my water bottle. I took one water bottle that was a liter and a half. So fill up was really easy and quick and efficient. And even though Katie and I certainly prefer to filter water instead of putting iodine into our body, we just did the math on how much time that was going to take. And we went with iodine because you fill up, you drop 30 minutes later, you can drink. So I'm not going to go through all my personal gear. It is there for you to see. Um, I'm wearing most of it. And just for time's sake, I will um, hit on a few points. It was important for me to take music. So I took my MP3 player and a really good playlist to opt into at times. Um, the sleeping bag, I had a 40 degree bag and a liner. I'm just gonna pull this up. Uh, super light, so super light sleeping bag. Um, it was 40 degrees and um, polar guard. And on the colder nights, I took in this liner, this very lightweight liner to add some warmth to it so that I was getting about a 30 degree bag. Um, it was chilly on our colder nights that probably dipped to 30, 29, 28. And that's why we took the two person tent so that we could create an extra amount of body heat in there. And it did help. So um, headlamp is important. Uh, trekking poles, Katie and I took one pair of trekking poles and we split the time with the trekking poles. By day seven, I believe it was, we both needed just to have one trekking pole the whole time because your legs are starting to, to feel that, that 183 miles and 65,000 feet of elevation gain, especially on the downhills. So Katie went over a lot of her personal gear. Um, for time's sake, we're gonna move on to food. 
and um, happy to share this list with people. And um, because it is being recorded, you can certainly pause and look at what we brought because you know what? Since the through hike, people have been reaching out to Katie and I, they're planning their own attempts. And Katie and I have this ID, uh, let's see, ideology to pass on knowledge that works. We want people to succeed. We want people to go for it. And we're gonna give you some tips. So sunglasses were important. And Katie is going to take over the food. All right. So with the food, it's really, it's a game of weight versus nutritional density, right? So we can't move forward if we don't have the fuel to move forward, but we also can't move forward if we have, you know, an excessive amount of weight on our backs reasonably. So um, we were shooting for about two pounds of food a day um, and we ended up planning it out with the storm day perfectly so that we ate our last, we each ate our last bite of food at the base of Esther Mountain, which was our final mountain. And then we descended down to the trailhead from there. So it ended up being the exact amount of food that we needed for the trip, which makes you feel really warm and fuzzy because you're like, okay, I did something right. Um, I didn't carry this this whole way <laughs> just to never eat it. <laughs> um, so uh, starting from breakfast, uh, one of my favorite things to do for breakfast is grab some of these carnation breakfast essentials. Uh, so they're just little powder packets um, and they come in different flavors, strawberry, chocolate, vanilla, that kind of thing. Throw that in a water bottle with just one of these, you know, instant coffee uh, packets, shake that up. And now you're walking and you're, you're having breakfast at the same time. Um, so that's just like, get on the trail. You've got calories coming into your body. Um, you've got some protein, you've got some caffeine to get you started, that sort of thing. Um, but you're not taking the time to stop and cook oatmeal and, and you're not wasting fuel, that extra fuel that you need to carry with you. Um, granola. So I actually very conveniently have my own um, granola and snack company uh, that I own and operate. So my husband and I make that um, right out of our home or home processors and we sell it to local farmers markets and things like that. Um, it's called Toganola. So our granola was definitely a staple. Um, it was really great because I just have very nutrient dense ingredients in the house. So I actually put together uh, a specific endurance granola for us that included things like turmeric for inflammation, ginger to keep our stomach settled, um, dark chocolate because dark chocolate, um, you know, on trail, that's like, you gotta have that. Um, so things like that, anything oat-based, which was full of carbs. So um, granola bars, things of that nature. Um, that was just like a real staple where you can just grab it, keep walking and just kind of be shoving that in your face and getting the carbs that you need. Um, Tailwind, uh, I think Bethany mentioned this before, was a huge win for us. So they come in different flavors. They're these powder packets. Um, some of them are caffeinated, some of them are not. Uh, if you were on part one, you heard our great story about how Bethany managed to over caffeinate herself on the first night and not sleep a wink. Um, but these overall were a huge win for us because these are 200 calories per packet. Um, they're electrolytes, and then they're also calories that you need in the background. So I think I did three or four of these a day in total. Um, so at 200 calories a pop, we're talking about, you know, almost a thousand calories that you're drinking in the background, because that's the other thing you need to be thinking about as well is digestion takes energy and you're using every ounce of your energy just to get yourself down the trail and carry your gear and get up that mountain. Um, so wherever we could reduce diet, you know, using our energy towards mechanically breaking down food or even thinking about, I need to get that food, you know, from my hip pocket to my mouth and chew it up that even is something that you save when you have it, your, your calories in your water and you're just inherently drinking them and getting them in the background. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to plan it. You don't have to remember to do it. Um, your thirst, you know, will drive you to just get those calories in. Um, green belly meals, I did use those intermittently. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, I don't have one to show you. They're basically like a super, super dense granola bar like product. Um, that's made specifically for through hikers. So a lot of folks on the Appalachian Trail, we use them. They're a little bit pricey. So uh, I think I used one every other day, um, but they are high in calorie content. So they were a great, you know, 
uh, weight to calorie ratio product to use. Uh, tortillas with cheese and jerky, just your basic tortilla wraps. Uh, I'd have two of these folded up in my baggie for the day. Um, and that's something else important that I wanna talk about too is food management. That's not something you wanna be trying to calculate on trail. Um, so one of the things we did to help ourselves out when we were deep in our journey and we, you just, your brain's not functioning 100% anymore. All your energy is going to your leg muscles at that point. Um, so there's not much left for your brain. You're, you're a little bit brain dead. Um, so we would just have each day marked out day one, day two, day three, and it would be in a Ziploc bag. And all of our calories for that day based on our itinerary were in that bag. And all we needed to know was that we needed to eat that bag by the end of the day. Before we laid down in our sleeping bag at the end of the day, everything had to be gone from that Ziploc bag that said day three, if that was the day that we were on. Um, so that really kind of just helps take any sort of, you know, mistakes out of the equation or, um, you know, thinking that you're not possible. It's not possible at that time because you just don't have the, the energy for it. Um, we did shoot for about 200 calories per hour per moving hour. So that was our goal. So with, you know, the carnation breakfast essential with the caffeine and then half of a granola bar, that would get me my 200 calories for my first hour. Um, then I might go to something like a peanut butter packet, lots and lots of peanut butter consumed on trail. Um, again, high um, weight to calorie ratio. Um, so this is a, a, a great option. And these packets are super convenient because they're about 190 calories per packet. So that's what you want for the hour, you know, um, we'd hold each other accountable, keeping an eye on our watches saying, okay, an hour has passed, we need to stop and drink and eat and make sure that we're, you know, maintaining ourselves in that way. Um, and if you just didn't have the energy for anything else, pop open one of the peanut butter packets, squeeze that into your mouth and, and you're good to go for another hour. And you know that you kind of check that box. I also had um, a craving for Nutella on trail. So what I ended up doing instead of the packets um, is take one of these kind of soft flask water bottles and I use uh, like one of those icing pipettes and I took a mixture of really sweet sugary peanut butter and Nutella and mixed those together and squeezed it into here and I would just be walking down the trail like squeezing Nutella mix into my mouth and you know, when you're a hundred miles in, that was just a magical thing. <laughs> and, and every time Katie did that, I was very jealous. But the first time she pulled it out, I was like, that's brilliant. That's the brilliant thing I've ever seen. So yeah, it was also just, you know, fun to like have, just be squirting this thing into your mouth, walking down the trail. It was just kind of like a fun treat. Like, oh, I got to get my, uh, my Nutella out now, you know? <laughs> um, so the other big thing that really worked out well for us was um, about three weeks before the through hike, I did the Northville Placid Trail, um, which is a, a local trail in the Adirondacks. It's doesn't go through the high peaks areas. You're not climbing any mountains. It's relatively flat comparatively to, to the through hike we did. Um, but over the course of seven days, I just did this as kind of a training run with my husband and some friends. And we kind of took it easy and did like 15, 20 miles a day. Um, and just before we left, I went to purchase dehydrated meals for the trip. And because of the pandemic, they were sold out everywhere. So I was like, all right, I guess, I guess I'll just try my hand at making my own. I'd never done it before. Um, and they ended up turning out really awesome. And my stomach was super happy that entire trip, super healthy, uh, just the best that's ever felt. So I knew for our unsupported through hike that that was a great option for us. Um, so I ended up making a bunch of just homemade dehydrated meals. Um, this is one of them I made, tuna and veggie mac and cheese, just super simple stuff. Um, and I just put them right into freezer Ziploc bags. You can actually put boiling water straight into these Ziploc bags. And as long as you're careful not to pierce it with a fork or something, they, they'll hold up um, and they are food safe. Um, and then we would just rehydrate right in these bags and eat out of Ziploc bags um, at the end of the day. Or if we preferred, we started actually doing these at lunchtime so we could just get that energy bomb kind of in the middle of the day to keep us going through the second half of the day. Um, our favorite ended up being what I call Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, so that was a mix of um, dehydrated uh, mashed potatoes, stuffing, uh, dried cranberries, 
um, dried chicken, um, and just a bunch of vegetables from my garden that I dehydrated, peas and carrots and corn and everything else. Um, and that ended up just being so hearty and so delicious and salty. And um, with the vegetables that I brought from home, it just kind of gave you that feel of, you know, that feel of home when you were eating it. So it was, it was psychologically a boost as well, I think. Yes. Um, yes. Food, you want to bring what you're going to eat. And that is really important in the planning and preparing phase two of bringing things that have some sentimental value to you, something that you're looking forward to because hunger doesn't always come on trail. Lots of people ask, oh my God, you must've been starving the whole time. Nope. I actually like, we had to make ourselves eat and we could feel ourselves start to bonk if we're just too focused on um, moving forward one foot in front of the other. This photo is us uh, the night before the through hike, just kind of chilling and um, trying to get a good night's sleep, which which we got, yeah, because mm -hmm. we were we were well prepared. Uh, this is our packs the day of when we started, so you fully packed, and like we've talked about, every ounce of gear matters, and we were pretty proud of ourselves for holding ourselves to or under that thirty pounds mark. Katie talked about the food systems. Anything yeah, you wanted I, to add on that? I think I covered everything. Yeah, I covered everything without referencing the slide. Go me. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And Katie's food is amazing. Toganola. She's a very humble person, so I will promote it all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's really it's amazing. It. And a little winter plug for her, her granola bars don't freeze. In yeah, the that is a huge cold. win. So yeah. they won't break your teeth. <laughs> Tested to negative 50 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I think at this time we're about 15 minutes out and we'll see what questions have come in because we can always take it another direction for a few minutes to go um, more specifically into one area, whether it's gear or food. I don't see any open questions at the moment. So if you have them, feel free to check, uh, type them in the Q&A box. I thought I saw something pop up in the chat if we wanna take a look at that. Yes. Uh, someone asked about the down bag and if it became an issue when the storm hit, um, if it didn't dry out as quick. And Bethany responded that the sleeping bag was synthetic. It dried out in by the time she had to go to bed and the liner didn't dry out. Yeah. Yep. So that was um, one of our reasons why we took synthetic in case it got wet. Ideally, though, uh, my stuff shouldn't have gotten wet or I wasn't planning on it getting wet because it definitely did get wet. Um, but what happened was Katie lined her bag with a plastic trash bag. I opted for a pack cover and it got pretty soaked through. So the synthetic bag was able to dry out pretty well before I went to bed because we had a little bit of a breeze. Um, the liner was still very wet because um, it's not synthetic. It's more of a, a cotton like material um, or a blend, it's blended. And so it ended up working out and um, overall it was a really good sleep system. And the one thing I would do differently for gear is I would have brought a trash bag. I would have lined my stuff uh, with a trash bag and that would have been my big um, difference and I probably would have brought a poncho too to like put over myself and to tuck my pack under it too and that would have been much better during the storm. Awesome all right questions have started coming in. <laughs> awesome. The first one is can you tell us about the supplements you took? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm, I think I probably took a little bit more than Bethany did, um, multivitamins just to make sure like you're getting all those essential nutrients because we're not eating whole fr fruits and eating whole vegetables and things like that. Um, so I wanted to make sure to incorporate that. 
Um, I am a big fan of CBD, especially at night. Bethany and I both took that. Um, I find it just kind of like eases me into sleep. Um, it tends to help with inflammation and things like that. So uh, just something lightweight to, to just be part of my same routine that I would normally have at home. Um, I also took creatine on trail. Um, that actually has more to do with uh, genetic osteoporosis related um, issue that my mother has and it was recommended to her. Um, I found I actually didn't like it. Some people I know take it as a supplement to actually help them uh, with muscle development and things like that. That wasn't my intention when I started taking it, but I figured, hey, you know, it, it, maybe it won't hurt. Maybe this will be a positive addition. Um, but what happens is if you, you are not thoroughly hydrated, it can actually lead to damage to the body, um, which I didn't know at the time. And, you know, with an effort like this, you just can't stay hydrated. Um, it's not possible to stay fully hydrated the whole time. So I ended up kind of regretting uh, that particular supplement and have since gone off it. Um, and um, branch chain amino acids was the other big one. Highly recommend if you don't, if you're an athlete or an avid hiker, someone who puts a lot of strain on your body, branch chain amino acids have so much research behind them proving their effectiveness in terms of um, reducing recovery times associated with workouts, hikes, you name it. Um, so I would take uh, two of those pills every morning and every night um, just to help with recovery and, and you know, uh, reduced muscle damage and things like that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how would you recommend women get into backpacking in the high peaks from being a day hiker slash car camper? Awesome. Great question. So I feel Marcy Dam is a great place to go into and it does get busy in there and there are lots of lean-tos in the area. So I know when I started camping, I really liked using the lean-to sites. And if you park South Meadows or LOJ, you're two miles away from your car if something goes wrong. So when I started camping, I liked to be that sweet spot of just maybe like two miles in so you can get back out. And um, so that's how I would recommend maybe starting. And then of course, finding someone who does it, partner up. Um, groups are fun. I, I'm definitely an extrovert and I like going out with people. However, I understand that's not for everyone. So if you prefer solo camping, you can find a lot of great spots a little bit more off the map in the Adirondacks. And once you start, and once you start exploring the map, there is just, there are so many places. Uh, Whiteface Landing is great. Uh, Round Pond in the Dix Range. The Dix Range actually has a lot of great camping. And there's, there's so many just tucked away and amazing lean-tos that are tucked away and that hardly get used and you'll have all to yourself, even during the summer. The Northville Placid Trail, if you wanna give yourself a challenge, I think that's really good training ground to go out and do a few days and maybe hike from Lake Placid to Long Lake or do a section hike of it over the course of a few days. Thank you. The next one is, did you consider taking a communication device like a Garmin inReach and what tools did you use for land navigation? Yeah, so I actually, I do have a Garmin inReach um, and there are a lot of times where I'll bring it in the field with me. Um, we didn't take one for this particular effort. Um, part of the reason was that our, our effort was being tracked pretty regularly. So we would send out messages at least twice a day, kind of giving the update. Um, we had folks we trusted that knew our itinerary. Um, we know these trails so well. Um, we had uh, evac plans for any possible situation that could have come up if we needed to drop and get out. We knew where we could go. Um, we knew where we could get service with a cell phone, that sort of thing. So um, we just didn't feel that it was necessary to bring one with us. Um, it wouldn't have added any extra benefit and it would have out added ounces. So um, we were in a position where it was like, if we're in trouble, we're, we're gonna take care of ourselves and we know how to do that. And um, you know, we're both highly experienced and um, we had folks on the outside ready to assist in it, you know, if that ever came up. So that's kind of why we ended up making that decision. Um, 
And then uh, what was the other half of the question? Oh, navigation. Um, so I'm super old school. I love mapping and compass. Like I'd never used a GPS before probably a year ago. Um, and I've been hiking in the Adirondacks for almost 14 years now. So um, I definitely used every opportunity I could to break up my compass and set an azimuth. When we did the bushwhack from um, the Dial Coal over to the Dix Range, that was map and compass. It's me setting the azimuth and us just following a trajectory. Um, some of the more complex bushwhacks where there were potential consequences, that's when we did break out our phones. So for example, when we did the bushwhack from the brothers to Porter, um, the reason you have to do that bushwhack is because the original trail was on private land and the private land owners, um, they closed that trail and they no longer allow public access to their land. So it was super, super important that we stayed off their land. So we did reference our phones to make sure, yes, we are actually skirting around that land and we're not trespassing at any time because A, we didn't want it to nullify our attempt and B, you know, I think it's really important to respect landowners' privacy. Um, they have the option to either open it to the public or not. And obviously they were wronged in some way and they made that choice. And I would never want to infringe on their property rights just because I want to go do this bushwhack. I want to go do this through hike. So um, we did want to make sure that we were, you know, within those confines and we use technology to help us do that. Any issues with wildlife during the hike? So we had some really friendly chipmunks. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in lots of sections where there's a junction with the mountain trails and a lot of hikers put their pack, packs down and maybe eat some food, the wildlife get used to that. So we did have a few of those chipmunks come up and they try to grab it right from your snack bags. Um, didn't have any crawl on us, but some were pretty close. So that was our Everybody. wildlife. It was chipmunks going after yeah. Katie's really tasty granola. <laughs> they did like the granola specifically. They did. Yeah. They kept going after it. Yep. And they were bold about it too. They'd go right while you were standing right there, they'd go after it. Um, but actually we get that question a lot and we're kind of bummed out to say, like we didn't see any super exciting or unusual or unique wildlife, um, which is interesting because you think we were out there for seven days that we, you know, stumble upon a black bear or, or whatever, you know, um, or a pie martin or something less than less, you know, common than a chipmunk. But uh, I like to think it's because we managed our food really well. You know, we were very diligent about our using our bear cans and things like that. So it's probably a good thing, a good sign that we didn't see a ton of wildlife. Just because you didn't see them doesn't mean that they weren't there. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm just That's saying. why I like the winter because you can see their footprints afterwards. Like, Smart. I never would have known you were here. <laughs> uh, the next question comes from someone interested in Leave No Trace. They asked about wipes used as toilet paper and did you pack out your used TP along with food garbage? So I actually don't use TP in the backcountry. Um, I am a, a leaf gal. <laughs> I find big leaves, soft leaves. Um, if there's no leaves, it's, you know, smooth sticks or rocks also work. Um, if you've never done this before, you're probably like, what the heck is wrong with her? But honestly, it's, I find it more pleasant than, than bringing PP into the back country and managing that situation. Um, and it works really well. You know, you can definitely keep yourself very clean um, using natural elements and then you just bury it in your cat hole. Yeah, stripes, maple and witch's hobble leaves work really well. I use leaves as well. And yes, we did pack out our wipes. Uh, we would put them in our food garbage at the end of the day and we packed them out. Mm -hmm. Yep, LNT is important to both Katie and I. And Katie's a trained LNT trainer. Or yep. yeah, that makes sense. That sentence makes sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> it actually did. It just oh my started. god, I've been I've been teaching all day. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> You're all scrambled. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we're going down to footwear. Both hiking shoes or trail runners? Boots for neither of you? Question mark. No nope, trail runners mm -hmm. all the way. Yeah. Um, that is not something I would suggest if you have 
chronic ankle issues. It was definitely a choice made by Katie and I out of preference. I don't hike with a high top hiking boot. I really never have. And I'm very blessed. I, I don't have ankle issues. Um, did take a brace just in case something popped up. And then we had tape to wrap as well. But Katie and I are both trail runners also. And I just feel more at ease in them. I feel like trail runners also have a better grip on the Adirondack rocks. Definitely. For, and are yeah. better for traction. Yeah. They're more breathable too. So you're less likely to have blister issues and, um, you know, trench foot style issues, that sort of thing. Like that comes with moisture on your foot being trapped. Um, cause water can just drain out and then they can just, you know, start to dry out at that point. Um, mm -hmm. there was a long time there where a lot of um, official organizations in the DEC were saying everyone should be in, in high top hiking boots for ankle stability and it prevents ankle injuries that lead to rescues. They're actually retracting a lot of those statements now because there's a lot of studies that are starting to show um, with some conclusion that that's not accurate. What you do when you put yourself in a high top boot is you're actually reducing uh, your ankles exposure to different movements that will actually create uh, more mobility and more strength over time. So that's a great thing about being on trail versus like road running, for example, is your, your foot is going over different terrain and rolling over rocks and, and rolling around roots and moving in different ways. And you're building strength in those fine motors, uh, fine muscles um, in your ankle and your foot. And you're also building mobility in your ankle and your foot, which actually leads to injury prevention. So they're starting to see a trend now that everyone's switching to, um, you know, low top or, or trail runners where they're seeing fewer ankle injuries, strains, sprains and breaks and things like that. So um, that science is kind of going back on itself a little bit now, which is awesome because when, when we know better, we do better, right? So um, personally, I'm, I'm a very minimalist person when it comes to footwear. I think we should let our feet do what they want to do naturally. We evolved that way for a reason, um, which is why I go with like the zero drop and the minimalist shoes and that sort of thing. So if you put me in boots, I'd be pretty unhappy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yep, me too. <laughs> Thank you. Question, the next question is, is there a place we can see the path you took? Yes. So Katie actually made a video that we will be uploading to YouTube mm -hmm. and trying to think how we can share that information with everyone, you can follow us on social media. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, but maybe there's a way we can coordinate with you, Christina, of who attended and getting it out to them. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah cause it's hard That's to great. visualize unless you kind of follow on the map. Yep. Even if you're familiar with the Adirondacks. Yep. Cool. Uh, the next question is, in Katie's chart for planning, can you explain the two classifications of pack as correlated to mileage? Uh, so I think they're talking about the table. Um, and I know I marked out what, what portions we were doing in day packs and what portions we were doing in full packs. So, so what we would do to save our bodies a little bit um, is we would drop pack, we'd remove all the food um, and then we would have a ultralight um, 22 liter pack that we would switch back and forth between the two of us with water, food, hard shells, first aid kit, like all the basics that we needed to go up the mountain with us. So at the base of out and backs, so that's what we would do is we'd drop the full packs, remove any temptation for the wildlife and, and any essentials that we needed, go up the mountain, come back down and then grab our packs and continue on. So I, the, basically the reason I broke it out is I just wanted to understand, obviously you're gonna be moving a little bit faster with a day pack on versus a full pack. Um, so that helped me kind of calculate out what our estimated time moving would be is the only reason I broke it out like that. Logic, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is Katie. And it also, it helps us uh, save our body and we just had to take those options when we had them. Even Definitely. if it meant stopping and unpacking and repacking, it was worth it. And in the end, we both really recovered pretty quickly from this and didn't have any lasting issues. 
the planning that you guys put into this is really impressive. <laughs> I must say. <laughs> you. Uh, Just make you feel ready, you know, when you got it all written out. Mm -hmm. What size packs did you wear? So mine was a 44 liter. And mine was a oh, 40. I believe it was a 40. And I also took the brain off of it. So um, that took away a little bit of the liters. So it was probably a little under a 40 liter pack. Um, but it did have a little thing right here. Oh no, I spoke wrong. It's a 45 liter pack. So without the brain, yeah, about the same. Yeah, 43, so 42, 43, probably. 40, 45. Yep. yep. And the nice thing was because we had our bear canisters, we kind of had like a rigid structure to store things in. So as soon as we started eating our food, it was super easy to pack our packs because we would just shove things in the bear canister that we didn't need access to during the day. So it was only really the first day, I would say, that our packs were like brimming full. And then after that, it was very comfortable to pack everything up. Yep. Speaking of bears, the next question is, did you take bear spray? Bless you, B. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did no, not. No, we take did not. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I get asked about this a lot. Um, so here in the Adirondacks, we only have black bears. We don't have any of the more aggressive um, species of bears. So we, it's not as much of a concern. Some of the things I'm going to say aren't necessarily applicable out West. Like there's places out West, you'll fly into the airport and there's bear spray canisters everywhere to buy because you really, you have to have one with you. Like the, you know, if you run into a grizzly, you're going to have a situation if you don't have some way um, to deter it. Um, but here in the Adirondacks, I never carry bear spray. I never carry a weapon of any kind. Um, I'm more scared of people than I am of the animals uh, because at the end of the day, bears are only going to get aggressive if they think they can get food from you. And if you show them that that's not a possibility, that's not going to happen, they're just going to leave and give up. Um, they, they have no desire to get into a confrontation with you. So um, I have heard stories in the Adirondacks where a bear will um, get very familiar with a popular campsite where people are maybe not making the best decisions on a regular basis. And so that bear is successfully going to these campsites and being a big scary bear in front of these humans and they're throwing food at it. And so you're just reinforcing that behavior. Um, I've heard of bears doing things like, you know, jumping up on logs, putting their paws in the air, you know, growling and making vocal, you know, aggressive sounding vocal um, noises. But at the end of the day, if you stand up to, you know, at, literally make yourself large, yell at it, keep the food away from it, make sure your food is secure, that sort of thing, they're, they're not going to attack you. Um, they just want the food. And once you prove that that's not going to happen, then they, they just sort of give up. So we all need to just be kind of doing our part, managing our food appropriately, using the bear's canisters where they're necessary, or other just as effective means of, um, you know, hanging food, that sort of thing. Um, and once the bears learn that they don't have access to that food, then it's just not going to be an issue anymore. Great. Thank you. Have either of you ever done a longer through hike? If so, how does that change your gear choices? Mm. So I do a bit of higher mountain expeditions and have gone to South America to climb Aconcagua, have done some stuff out West, um, have done the John Muir Trail. And so I consider that like a longer through hike. It was 200 miles. Gear choices are very similar um, trying to go as light as possible, but obviously with higher mountain stuff or with a longer, more remote through hike, you do need to take more emergency gear just in case something happens. And with the John Muir Trail, we did a food drop. You know, we had um, a resupply halfway through so that that saves with food weight. And it Definitely, it always depends on the weather. It depends on the amount of days you're gonna be out there. And then you calculate what you have to bring to be safe. That's how I do it. Like, what do I need to be safe 
in this situation. So with the through hike, we went very sparse because we knew that Katie and I had already agreed, you know, we're not going to just complete this for the sake of completing this. We knew that we were going to do it in a safe way and A, B, C, or D could happen and we might not have the gear to deal with it. Um, that's very different, um, say, to high mountains. So I have a lot more packed and lots of times at the end of those expeditions, I'm looking at the gear I took and I'm like, wow, I never used that, but I'm glad I had it mm -hmm. with me. Yeah. Yeah. And one example of that uh, uh, on the emergency gear is, you know, normally if I'm out in a remote area, I would bring something um, like, you know, a splint, like a Sam splint or something like that. But on an expedition like this, you know, we're being tracked. People know where we are. They're ready to assist us. And if something happens where we need a Sam splint, we're not finishing the through hike. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, it's, it, you're just, you just have a different mindset around what you're bringing on a situation like this. Um, whereas if it was more of a recreational trip where we didn't have um, the support system on the outside in case we needed it, um, we didn't have people tracking us day to day, that sort of thing. And we were more reliant on ourselves then I would have been, been bringing my full first aid kit, which is kind of robust. <laughs> my <laughs> friends joke that I carry a 30 liter pack and a 20 liter first aid kit normally. So it was yeah. definitely a change for me. Like, you know, yeah. he had to have a kind of a conversation with me. Like, this isn't your normal trip. We can't, we just can't carry a huge first aid kit. You yeah. know, that's, we don't have the ounces for that. And we have to think about what are we reasonably going to need um, that yeah. that could actually stop us from moving forward. So something silly like a blister, if it gets bad and painful enough, it would stop us. So we were very prepared on that front. Um, so you're just kind of thinking about scenarios and realistically, what do you need to address them and which scenarios uh, bring you to the point where you're just stopping. So it doesn't matter what you have in the field with you or not. Very good. Next question. So between you, did you have one full pack and one day pack or two full packs plus a day pack? That one. Second. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <So. laughs> we had two full packs and then Katie has this awesome little day pack that pretty much squishes down to nothing. So she packed that in her full pack. And then when we were able to drop packs, pulled that out, we put in some water, we put in some food, we put in some layers and we went and then we returned to our full packs. Makes sense. Um, how were you being tracked? Was it just your check-ins? Yeah, so we had our check-ins and then we also had GPS watches that we were tracking and then like uploading at the end of the days and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So between the two, we had pretty good tracks on where we were any given uh, at the basically at the beginning and the end of the day, we do a formal check in at minimum. And did you have a stretching routine to start and end the day? That's a good question. That, that is, is a, a really good question. Great question. And it's a part of our story for sure, because I come from the camp of I don't really stretch and I didn't stretch. Um, so Katie and I are opposites on lots of things. And I think that's good for um, presentations like this, because I can say one thing that works for me. And then Katie says one thing that works for her. And you can see that it really is trial and error and um, figuring out what works for you. So I did not stretch before or after. Sometimes during, you know, like pause and do that calf stretch. Um, but I, I can't really impress you or, or say like, yeah, I was stretching all the time. I just, I didn't do it and it was okay. But Katie um, has a, has a story for the benefits of stretching. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I normally am someone who stretches daily. I have a, a room in my house that is the yoga room and the mats stay on the floor at all times. And you know, I'll spend, you know, what, an, at least an hour, if not more in there um, every day. And on the through hike, um, you definitely get to the point where you're kind of in survival mode after a couple days. And at the end of the day, it's just like, I know I should, but I just really want to lay down right now. <laughs> and so I didn't utilize my recovery tools 
um, as much as I should have. And that actually came back to bite me. I ended up having some pretty severe quad pain um, the last two and a half days or so um, where my muscles just, they were pretty angry. And um, some of it was, I'm very, I've traditionally always been very quad dominant. I don't engage uh, my glutes and my hamstrings enough, which is like 99% of the population, um, which is a muscle imbalance that I've since corrected. Um, and I see a huge difference in my strength uh, associated with that. So I definitely encourage you to explore that. Um, if you're somebody who sits a lot, who's in an office, who's driving a lot, um, that actually will, will cause your hamstrings and your glutes not to engage readily. Um, and so you just, you're not working them, your quads will take over um, and you just end up getting this big muscle imbalance, which is what happened to me. Um, but normally, yeah, I, I'm very diligent with my stretching routine. I do a lot of yoga. I do a lot of mobility specifically. Um, if that's not something that's in your routine, I definitely encourage you to look into mobility. Um, it's not pretty or sexy like yoga is. Um, it's very like mundane and you're moving slowly and the moves are like kind of boring looking, um, but it works really well because what you're doing is you're not just stretching the muscle, you're strengthening it in that stretched position, um, which is really what you need and want as an athlete. So if you're looking to increase your hiking ability um, or any, any athletic ability, mobility is definitely the way to go. Um, and then also I've discovered a lot of recovery tools as a result of the through hike. Um, I did do some damage to my quad and that's something that I, you know, it took a, a week or two to relieve itself. And that gave me some downtime, not on my feet to, to go, okay, so what are the things that maybe will prevent this next time? Um, muscle scraping is a huge tool in my recovery toolbox. Um, if you're not familiar with it, definitely Google it. Um, you are literally scraping the fascia. Um, uh, you know, anywhere on your body, really, I scrape the bottom of my feet my Achilles, my calf, uh, my hamstrings, my quads. I have a whole routine that I do right before I go to sleep at night, every night. It keeps everything um, just a lot healthier. I, I feel myself recover through the night and I feel myself have reduced um, muscle pain and fatigue associated with training. So um, that was a huge realization that I had kind of after the through hike that, hey, here's a tool. Um, and they do make scrapers that are very small and lightweight. And I plan to bring those on all my future extended FKTs just as a tool to keep me healthy, so. Yeah, that's a great lead into the next question, which you partially already answered. It said, how long did it take you both to recover after the excursion and what did you do to recover? Yeah. So for me, I had attempted the through hike in 2016. So I would say I really entered a phase of being an endurance athlete uh, about four years ago and got a little more in depth in it. And um, so for me, I took three weeks off after I had really not too much pain. Um, I slept 15 hours. Um, after we got out of the woods, I showered, I ate a sandwich and I went to bed at six o'clock and I did not wake up until nine o'clock the next day. So, um, but really after like 24 hours, 48 hours, I felt pretty normal, um, but I made myself rest and not do anything. And then uh, three weeks later, I got back in the mountains and um, did some trail running and shorter FKTs and it felt pretty good. My knees weren't a hundred percent until about a month later on downhills. Um, but overall pretty good recovery. What I did was I slept, I stayed off my feet and that's kind of what I did. Yeah. Yeah. And this was, uh, the through hike was kind of my first endurance event. Um, I'd done other big days, you know, 40 mile days and things like that, but it would be one or two days and then I'd be off my feet. So this was the first time my body was experiencing anything like this. Um, so it definitely took me a little bit longer than it took B to recover. I would say to get back to hundred percent, like training at my full capacity again, um, it was about three months, uh, before I was 100% again. Um, and part of that was, I didn't realize it during the through hike, but I actually, um, did a little bit of damage, acute damage to my Achilles. 
Um, and some of that has to do with the zero drop shoes that I wear and the fact that I just wasn't stretching my, my calves appropriately. Um, and when you're not, when you have tight calves over time, it pulls on the Achilles and it starts to cause irritation. And so um, that's something that I had to, to deal with for a little while and just, you know, not run like I wanted to and not hike big days like I wanted to for a little while because I just needed them to heal and tendons don't heal quickly. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure I didn't, you know, go down the road of like rupturing them or causing more damage or anything like that. So, so it did take me a solid couple of months to get back to hundred percent again. And, and like I said, it was just a ton of mobility every day for an hour a day, mobility, stretching, yoga, um, foam rolling, um, muscle scraping every single night. Um, so just being, being really diligent about my recovery and never skipping it, you know, um, for me, I learned so much about recovery and the value that at this point, if, if it's a choice between, I only have time to, you know, train or do a recovery routine. I'm always going to pick the recovery routine because recovery is just so important. You can't train at your full capacity without it. So. Okay. Um, that's the last of the questions in the Q and A and in the chat. So awesome. I just like to wrap this up by thanking everyone for attending and especially thank the two of you for your time and your expertise. This was awesome. Um, I really appreciate it. And if you'd both like to give any last minute short advice to anyone who's looking to get into this or where they can find more information to keep up with you guys. Oh, and share maybe how they could buy some of your granola, Katie. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that'd be great. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Toganola snack company.com is our website. It's T O G A N O L A Toganola Saratoga granola is where it comes from. Um, we are based out of Saratoga Springs, New York area. Um, and we have an online store and we're also at farmer's markets in the Saratoga Springs area. So, um, but we are a very small family owned business. So we appreciate any support. Um, you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook. We consider ourselves outdoor educators and we try to post a lot of helpful tips and hints and um, advice on a regular basis. Um, I do trail tip Tuesday. So, you know, just trying to give different advice that you might not have heard before. Um, Adirondack Mountain Rescue, my SAR team, uh, at least once a year, we do a public education uh, seminar where we do, it's basically like winter hiking 101, talking about safety and leave no trace associated with um, winter hiking, specifically in the high peaks in the Adirondacks, but also applicable to other areas, um, just to kind of start people out if they're not sure how to get out safely and uh, what gear and knowledge they need to have. Uh, so that's a great way to get educated. And then also just going out with people that are experienced. Um, there are a ton of hiking groups in the area. She Jumps has events all the time. Um, I know some of them are, you know, based out of the Adirondacks and hiking related. Um, so find a group that you feel comfortable with and don't be afraid to ask questions, you know, like everybody was a beginner at one point. So yeah. just put yourself out there and, and start learning and then you can start sharing your knowledge with other people. Yeah, I'm going to go off of what Katie just said there to kind of wrap this up is I appreciate all of my mentors and all of the people that have helped me in the past to get to where I am today. And the through hike for me began in 2009 and talking to Corey and Jan, the two men who first did this, and they took the time to talk to me when I reached out. So that is something that Katie and I really try to hold ourselves to as well and reach out to us on social media. We are happy to help, whether it's just a day hike in the high peaks or a tip for gear or what we're using, we like answering these questions and we will always give back. So that is like one piece of advice just for you too. like always give back to your communities and be humble and be grateful. And I am so thankful for being able to do this with Katie. I'm thankful she came into my life. I am you know, so blessed and I'm so thankful that Christina reached out to us to do these talks for She Jumps. And I'm thankful now to like be a brand ambassador for She Jumps and promote like more girls getting outside. And so, you know, just, dream and go after your dreams and you know what if they don't work out the first time don't give up you know i did not get the through hike the first time i went for it and came back with katie and we got it so don't give up 
Excellent. That was a perfect wrap up. <laughs> well, thank you guys all for coming. And I hope you have a good rest of your night. I'm going to stop recording now. Yep. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>